I don't need to tell you the depravity of war. You are all too familiar with its images, with the refugees of war, with information that we have revealed showing the everyday squalor and barbarity of war. Information such as the individual deaths of over 130,000 people in Iraq. Individual deaths that were kept secret by the US military who denied that they ever counted the deaths of civilians. Instead, I want to tell you what I think is the way that wars come to be and that wars can be undone. In democracies, or the pseudo-democracies that we are evolving into, wars are a result of lies. The Vietnam War and the push for US involvement was a result of the Gulf of Tonkin incident. A lie. The Iraq War famously is a result of lies. Wars in Somalia are a result of lies. The Second World War and the German invasion of Poland was a result of carefully constructed lies. That is war by media. Let us ask ourselves of the complicit media, which is the majority of the mainstream press. What is the average death count attributed to each journalist? When we understand that wars come about as a result of lies peddled to the British public and the American public and the publics all over Europe and other countries, then who are the war criminals? It is not just leaders, it is not just soldiers, it is journalists. Journalists are war criminals. And why one might think that that should lead us to a state of despair, that the reality that is constructed around us is constructed by liars is constructed by people who are close to those that they are meant to be policing. It should lead us also to an optimistic understanding because if wars can be started by lies, peace can be started by truth. Peace can be by truth. So that is our task and it is your task. Go and get the truth. Get into the ballpark and get the ball and give it to us and we'll spread it all over the world. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syrian Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Almasian. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Larry Johnson. He is a veteran of the CIA and the State Department's Office of Counterterrorism. He is the co-founder and managing partner of Berg, B-E-R-G Associates, and he provided training to the U.S. military special operations community for 24 years. His website is sonar21.com. His Telegram and Substack are also in the description below. Mr. Larry, thank you for being my guest today. We're going to discuss together the American war machine in different regions uh, of the world, in, in Western Asia or the Middle East, in Ukraine, and a little bit in Taiwan. And I would really like to have your perspectives on these different uh, issues. And I'm sure the audience of Syrian Analysis would appreciate your insight as well. Thank you, Kavork. Thank you for the invitation. 
It's a uh, great uh, to have you on my channel. At the beginning, I was uh, before I uh, ask you political questions. I do also some research about the guest that I am hosting, and it seems it, it, I have read a few hit pieces. I would say uh, <laughs> about you. <laughs> you think? <laughs> and it's yeah, yeah. And it seems to me, and it seems to me that you are vilified by powerful people. Uh, who have you angered, and why are they trying to destroy you to begin with? Well, I, I think it's probably we'll have a shorter list if we come up with who haven't I angered. <laughs> so uh, I, I've been known to I've been critical of both uh, Republicans and Democrats over the years. Uh, I, I, you know, I have my own personal views and I don't bring any kind of partisan politics to it. I, I try to objectively call what's happening. And, it's, uh, you know, there was a period prior to the rise of Barack Obama when I was quite, quite critical of George W. Bush and his administration of their policies in, in Iraq. And even at that time, I held top secret clearances. I was working with U.S. military special operations. I was even asked to go to Iraq on a particular mission. It sounds very uh, secretive, but it was, it was actually just to train somebody uh, to mm -hmm. deal with some public relations issues, of all things. Uh, but even during that period, I was critical of Bush. Democrats love me. Oh, boy, they carried me around on their shoulders. I even gave the Democrats national radio address on one Saturday hmm. uh, in 2004, 2005. So it's not like I was some body all well outside the mainstream. But then I became critical of Barack Obama. And all of a sudden, I was persona non grata. So the neocons hate me. Uh, the Barack Obama wing of the party hates me. The Hillary Clinton wing of the party hates me. That's okay. You know, uh, I call it as I see it. Yes, I think um, the powerful people that you mentioned are um, extremely dangerous, and especially that they hold power <clears throat> over the media. And uh, they can commit what is called character assassination against personalities like yourself. But this is a character assassination we're seeing a number of assassinations, killing and murder and mayhem in the Middle East nowadays. Right, and right. as an expert in uh, counterterrorism, how do you evaluate Israel's campaign against what Tel Aviv calls uh, a war on terrorism in the Gaza Strip? Yeah, t terrorism has become, uh, it, is, it is to the West what enemy of the state was to the Soviet Union. So during the Soviet Union period, if you declared somebody an enemy of the state, you could do anything to them, to lock them up, deny them of their freedom, kill them, uh, because they were an enemy of the state. And as such, they represented a threat to the state. Well, now we've used that same sort of concept, but we use the term terrorism in terms of uh, it's really synonymous with enemy of the state. And as such, uh, in the West, the state must be preserved at all costs, which means you can do anything to anyone just as long as you can claim that they are a terrorist. And so, so we label Hamas as a terrorist organization because, you know, Hamas truly is a, uh, it is what I would call a religious extremist organization. Uh, it espouses uh, certain views with respect to Islam that are not necessarily reflective of mainstream Islam. But the root of what they're fighting about is their belief that Israel has taken land from them and they're fighting for their land. Now, we had an entire revolution here in America back in the 1700s, 1776. And I had 28 ancestors who fought in that war. Under today's criteria, all of my ancestors were terrorists, okay? They, because they fought against the established state at the time, the United Kingdom. And if you go back and pull out the language that was used by people like Patrick Henry, uh, among others, or uh, Thomas Paine, clearly uh, insurrectionists, clearly language of uh, violence, uh, but they were fighting for a concept of freedom, liberty, and the ability to make one's own decisions. So the, the concept of terrorism that's used by the Israelis, used by the West, is an attempt to discredit the other side. But here's the odd thing with it, or the, the hypocrisy. Uh, Iran's a terrorist, a terrorist state, right? 
Yeah. And they've been so since 1979, since they took over. Yeah. So who was selling weapons to that terrorist state in the 1980s? Well, it was the United States and Israel. Israel. Yes, they did. Yeah, they, they came to uh, uh, Washington, D.C. and met with uh, Ronald Reagan's advisors and asked for permission to sell American-made weapons to Iran. Now, this was after Iran had taken a U.S. diplomat, or the Iranian students had taken U.S. diplomats hostage. And you'd think that, no, Ronald Reagan, boy, he's tough on terrorism. It's black and white. There's no gray area. <laughs> Forget about that. They went ahead and gave Israel the thumbs up. Why? Because Israel was more concerned about the threat of Iraq and the uh, nuclear power plant it was building. So we happily sold weapons to Iran, a terrorist state. And that went on for eight years until the whole Iran Contra thing blew up and it was exposed. And then the Reagan administration did everything to pretend, oh, we didn't know anything about that. Gee, where did that happen? So, and, and here again, Israel. Israel has dealt with terrorist organizations throughout its history. So terrorism is just, it's a convenient label they use to smear people in the media to distract uninformed people so that they can basically justify whatever it is that they want to do. Yeah, but what about the military tactics uh, used by Israel? Nowadays, we can see that there is a bombardment campaign yeah. against the Gaza Strip, and there is a ground offensive against the Gaza Strip. Uh, does it is it convenient for you, uh, or does it make sense that this is military strategy that is being adopted in the Gaza Strip aims at Hamas, or also it has other considerations there? Yeah, so Hamas has not. Uh set up military bases and identifiable headquarters in the Gaza Strip. In other words, they haven't said, uh, you know, hey, if you want to come meet with our command structure, come to, uh, you know, 555 Al Jazeera Street. You know, hmm. they just, they don't have that kind of address. So when you're looking at it from a targeting standpoint of the Air Force, they're going on, quote, intelligence. And not all intelligence is reliable or valid. and the end result is what we're seeing. They're killing civilians. They're destroying civilian structures, homes, apartments, businesses. And the, you know, you always got to step back and say, what is it that we're doing militarily? What's our ultimate objective? Okay, our ultimate objective is to defeat Hamas, to isolate Hamas. Good. How is this working out? Well, the bombing is creating more supporters for Hamas, not only within and among Palestinians, but the fact that you get Bashir al-Assad uh, sitting down with uh, Haji Erdogan in Saudi Arabia shows you how uh, dramatic the, the, the forces bringing unity among Arab and Muslims has been. You know, the, that wouldn't have happened a year or two ago by any stretch. Similarly, Iran and Syria, or Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, uniting. Um, again, that is a significant sign of the opposition that's growing. So Israel's military campaign is doing the exact opposite. Instead of weakening Hamas, it's strengthening Hamas. That's the air campaign. On the ground, Israel is extremely cautious. They're, they're, they're putting out lots of reports that are sort of the cheerleading the rah-rah, look, boy, what we're doing to Hamas. But they really haven't penetrated into the heart of Gaza. And the reason they haven't is because Hamas does have these tunnels. They have anti-tank guided missiles. They have a variety of techniques and fighters willing to die that they can inflict terrible losses on Israel. So Israel's ability, yeah, Israel has the place surrounded. Well, it's had the place surrounded for what, you know, 15 years, 20 years? Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, they say it's the largest outdoor prison in the world. Uh, but in terms of actually being able to destroy Hamas militarily, that the, the, situ the ground just does not lend itself to that. Meanwhile, while Israel's trying to do that, it's facing a growing threat on its northern frontier because Hezbollah has stepped up its attacks on Israeli uh, military outposts, bases, and some of the kibbutzim that have uh, are along the northern border, they're evacuating, the, the Israelis have evacuated those. So uh, Israel is not in a position 
that it can fight a two-front war. If Hezbollah decides to ramp up and get in, and worse, if uh, the Turkey decided to finally intervene militarily, I, I think it's unlikely, but you know, Erdogan has raised that as, uh, as one possibility. Uh, Israel would, would be uh, you know, facing certain defeat. I think Erdogan will send his prayers uh, to the Palestinians uh, <laughs> more than anything else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, he's been sending prayers to the Palestinians and drones <laughs> to the Azerbaijanis that can be used against the uh, Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh in the past uh, 20 years, as far as I was concerned about it. But there is another country, a uh, neighboring country that is also witnessing what is called the war against terror, and this is Syria. And uh, the Syrian uh, government says they are fighting against terrorism as well since 2011. What's your take on the Syrian army uh, campaign and approach against the US-backed, Turkish-backed, and the regional countries-backed militant groups there? Can, you ca can we categorize it as a war against terrorism, or the Syrian government is trying to justify the suppression of, um, let's say, legitimate demands or revolution or an uprising against what they call the Assad regime? Yeah, this is a war of terrorism, in my view, against Syria. So, you know, let's go back to 2011 and then jump into 2012. So the United States and Great Britain began coordinating with the, with the start of the Arab Spring. And I, and, I, and I think that both CIA and British intelligence were heavily involved in that whole Arab Spring movement. And I think maybe the underlying purpose was to sort of loosen the political control of the established elites so that the economic interests in the West could come in and, and begin to sort of pick off and pluck, harvest what, what the, the, those economic resources. And, you know, Syria, in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks back in 2001, tried to cooperate with the George W. Bush administration in going after radical Islamic extremists. And uh, you know, I don't want to, to, you know, I'm not trying to smear Islam. These are radical extremists within Islam and you know, people like ISIS and others. They, are, they use violence as a means uh, to express their views as well as you know, they're, they're too weak to attack militarily head on. Well, what then happened with the start of the Arab Spring, the United States and the United Kingdom decided time to get rid of Bashar al-Assad and, and were working with Turkey. Turkey was all in favor of it because it would give Turkey a chance to come in from the north, take territory that it's wanted. And so the United States and Britain start funding terrorist groups in Syria. This is one of the things that the vast majority of American public and in, in, in the West don't understand, that the, the rhetoric of the United States, oh, we're in an inter internal war against terrorism, except we find a bunch of terrorists that we like and we'll take the label off of them. They're no longer terrorists, they're freedom fighters. I uh, did the same with Iran, with the Mujahideen al khalq a Mech, a terrorist group that had carried out terrorist attacks in Iran. The U.S. rehabilitated them so they continued fighting. And that, that's what was sort of behind, uh, involved with this Benghazi CIA base. That was, it was, a, it was a base that was being used to collect weapons in Libya and send them forward via Cyprus into Turkey. And then from Turkey, they were being smuggled in or delivered to radical Islamists fighting against the government of Bashar al-Assad. And what the West didn't count on was that Russia would finally intervene on behalf of Syria and would, would bring a halt to the, uh, the, the terrorist attacks that were being promulgated, promoted, encouraged by the West. So that terrorist battle of Syria trying to reestablish control over its territory continues. And you have in eastern Syria these U.S. military bases, you know, several of them, who have now been under almost day attack by a variety of groups, many who are have ties to Iran, and they are inflicting casualties on these bases. And it's sort of as as the pressure increases in Gaza against the Palestinians, the attacks on the U.S. bases in western or eastern Syria are increasing. So uh, all of this is tied together. It's all tied together as well with the war in Ukraine. So we can't we can't look at any of this in isolation. 
Yes, uh, I've been I've been talking to uh, some people in Syria, and they tell me the Americans do not have a strategic interest in toppling the Assad regime, but they did it because of Israel. They wanted to ease the uh, security pressure on Israel because Syria uh, is part of what they call the axis of resistance, and Syria has been used also as a transit of uh, weapon transit to Hezbollah, and Hezbollah started to smuggling these weapons to the Gaza Strip. Is it is it, is it safe to say that this was a, a war, a regime change war initiated by the CIA and the Pentagon with the allies in the region to uh, ease the security pressure on Israel rather than achieving the national security or the strategic interests of the United States? It's possible that that was one of the reasons, but I always say follow the money. There were some, there were some economic benefits to be derived in this. This was this not purely, all. Oh, let's defend Israel. That it's almost like let's defend Israel becomes an excuse, hmm. a justification, uh, that to, to really cover up what else is going on. Uh, because you know, when you go back and look, at, for example, at the activities of the Clinton Foundation, you know, the Clinton Foundation had was collecting money from a variety of people, particularly in the Middle East, uh, that were had direct financial interests in Syria, in oil and gas, among other things. So. Uh, yeah, this is about this is about economic interests and power. The you know protecting Israel from attack from the north. As long as Israel's not out attacking the Palestinians, if if Israel is just minding its own business, it has sufficient military strength to to fend off anything that Syria would have done. And Syria wasn't crazy. Syria was not in the process of planning uh, gathering an army on. Uh, in the Golan Heights to descend upon Israel and take it over. That's, you know, it's just nonsense. Uh, this was, um, you know, a, this has been an orchestrated war, what has taken place in Syria. And the West, you know, the West has blood on its hands, same as what happened in Libya. You know, at, at some point, the world needs to wake up that the United States keeps saying we're out there fighting for freedom, for democracy. But, you know, we're fighting for uh, uh, some dollar bills. And, Ask me about it. Yeah. <laughs> I was in Syria when the war started and I've been on the ground. And the stuff that we saw with our own eyes, it's beyond its beyond anything that I have seen. Uh, in I, I'm a third generation survivor of the Armenian genocide. And my grandparents used to tell me about the stories of what my grandparents used uh, were, were suffering from under the mm -hmm. Ottoman Empire. And then we started seeing them in front of our eyes and also on YouTube and on the social media platforms, how they were decapitating and doing all these heinous crimes right, uh, right, to, right. to civilians, to civilians before militants. <clears throat> and they were they were killing on your ethnicity. Like if you're an Armenian, if you're a Christian, if you are, you are, you are. Like they have a list of ethnicities and religions that they... Uh, completely despised and they wanted to ethnically cleanse these people and there were so many incidences of ethnic cleansing and genocide in northern Latakia for example and the attacks that happened they were orchestrated by the CIA they, they had a, a joint military operation room in southern Turkey and they were guiding these forces to attack on Syria the weaponry yeah. um, uh, were, were, uh, were American the guidance was American this is very unfortunate thing to say and uh, lots of people unfortunately also do not know but it's very good to speak about these cases. And nowadays, there are increasing voices, for example, calling on Biden to withdraw from Syria. And I was reading this article on the defense priorities, and this is published on the 11th of October by Daniel uh, De Petris. He, this is, those are the key points. He says, one, after 12 years of civil war, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad's government has consolidated its power, I would just make it this a little bit bigger, yeah, consolidated its power yeah. and defeated credible threats to its rule. The anti-Assad armed groups, which once controlled half of Syria, is relegated to the northwestern province of Idlib. While the Biden administration recognizes that Assad will likely remain in office, U.S. policy remains punitive, maintaining comprehensive sanctions on Syria until Assad negotiates political reforms with his opponents and agrees to free and fair elections. Three, this policy will not produce the desired results. Assad is firmly entrenched. 
benefits from the help of security partners in Iran and Russia, who prefer that he stays in power and remains highly unlikely to comply with U.S. demands. The status quo amounts to collective punishment of the Syrian people. Approximately 900 U.S. troops remain in eastern Syria, allegedly to train and advise the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces against ISIS, but ISIS lost its territorial caliphate more than four years ago. The risk of keeping U.S. forces there in perpetuity, which includes sporadic attacks on U.S. positions and escalation risks with various actors, outweighs any rewards. Five, neither the sanctions nor the occupation of eastern Syria serves U.S. security interests. The former does no good, and the latter risks embroiling the United States in a mission without an end date. Finally, the United States should withdraw its remaining forces and the flawed what is left of the counter-ISIS mission to local actors, the United States should also reduce, if not end, its failing or failing sanctions regime. Those are points yeah. made uh, only recently. Um, do you think that the Biden administration has any intention to reduce its presence or withdraw from Syria or lift the sanctions, or there is no appetite for that in Washington, D.C.? Uh, if you would have asked me that two months ago, I'd say no. Now I think, yeah, yes, it's, it's probably on the table because the losses among American personnel at these various bases, and, and they're, in, they're in Eastern Syria and, and also in Iraq, uh, they're growing. It's becoming quite numerous. Uh, they're filling up the hospital ward at the Walter Reed Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. And uh, it, particularly if the attacks intensify and they start killing more Americans, then it becomes sort of an untenable situation. Uh, this, you know, what, what, what's so bizarre about all of this is that in the early days, Bashar al-Assad was known for defending the rights of Christians and non-Muslims. You know, and his, his only beef was with these Muslim extremists who would broker no compromise of any sort. And yet, that's who the United States and the United Kingdom uh, aligned themselves with in order to, you know, because they were working with Turkey throughout this as well. I mean, we can't, we can't forget Turkey's role in, in creating a lot of this uh, murder and mayhem uh, because it was, in fact, if you just prior, a week prior to the attack on the CIA center there in Benghazi, the CIA base, CIA Director David Petraeus was in Turkey meeting uh, with Turkish officials, basically coordinating, saying, look, we got this election that's coming up in about uh, two months. We need to back off the arms distribution because we're worried that there could be some blowback that could affect Barack Obama's campaign, re-election campaign. Hmm. And that was why Ambassador Chris Stevens actually went to Benghazi to work out and coordinate with his Turkish contacts there on the ground how that this you know, what to deal with the weapons that were already in the pipeline and, and how to coordinate this going forward. And it, <clears throat> he was then, you know, ambushed and killed along with several uh, contractors at the CIA base. Uh, so that was, um, I don't know if that was precipitated by, it was just a coincidence that the Al-Qaeda elements who carried out that attack to, decided to do it on the anniversary of 9-11 or if it was a reaction, a pushback from those groups in Syria that, that were getting weapons from the Turks and said, I mean, had been informed that they were going to get cut off, that they went back and launched the attack as sort of retaliation against the Americans. The point is, the United States has not been an instrument of peace and reconciliation in the region by any stretch of the imagination. We've been one of the major causes of murder and mayhem in the region. Unfortunately, I have to agree with you on this. Uh, since I opened my eyes to politics, uh, I remember uh, the Second Intifada and I remember uh, also the Iraq war, especially when I, I we, in yeah. Syria, we used to dislike Saddam Hussein uh, passionately. You, the relations were not good between Syria and Iraq. But when it, Baghdad was overthrown, I, I remember I was just a child and I <clears> cried <throat> because since then my my gut feeling said this is not about Saddam Hussein. This is about destroying the country. And then the divisions happened 
Iraq is now divided into three parts and the national uh, wealth of the country is being robbed by, I would say, very corrupted politicians. Demo there is no democracy there. There are some elections. Elections aren't always equal to democracy. And the security situation is uh, not perfect. And right, I, right. I, I, truly, I truly believe that if you want to build a nation state, the ABC for it is first to establish a security, stability, economic welfare, social welfare, and then you start developing on a technological level. And uh, at last it comes the elections, your human rights and all these things. But you cannot tell me that I have to adopt all this, what is called the Western values or Western style human rights in the entire right. Middle East before before stability, before security, before establishing uh, the pillars of the of the nation state, and this is something that I suffer in explaining, unfortunately, to uh, what what I call the so-called Western pundits. If we if we if we take one step back, that we were, we were speaking about Lebanon and uh, speaking about uh, Israel, this is from the Axios. Uh, I think this was 15 hours ago. They say Austin warned Gallant about Israeli military actions in Lebanon. So according to this report, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin expressed concern to his Israeli counterpart, Yoav Gallant, in a call on Saturday about Israel's role in escalating tensions along the border between Israel and Lebanon, according to three Israeli and U.S. sources briefed on the call. Why it matters? Austin's message to Gallant reflected growing anxiety in the White House that Israeli military action in Lebanon is exacerbating tensions along the border which could lead to a regional war. Some in the Biden administration are concerned Israel is trying to provoke Hezbollah and create a pretext for a wider war in Lebanon that could draw the U.S. and other countries further into the conflict, according to sources briefed on the issue. Israeli officials flatly deny it. Yeah. If we... If we accept this as, let's say, an accurate report, why would what what is the interest of Israel in expanding the war in the region? Well, the, the tit for tat, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know the the whole the Old Testament uh, revenge uh, theme, uh, because Hamas has been, I mean Hezbollah has been carrying out attacks on Israeli military positions. And you've got uh, Benjamin Netanyahu talking extremely tough about, boy, don't you dare or we're going to, you know, do what? And it shows nobody's learned a damn thing over the last, well, now 43 years, go back to 1980. And then when Israel first went into uh, or back the uh, attacks on the uh, the refugee camps and Shatilas uh, and uh, the murdered, you know, thousands of, uh, uh, of of Muslims. And then the United States got embroiled in the war uh, with uh, Hezbollah in the Bakal Valley in 1983. And Hezbollah retaliated by blowing up the Marine barracks in April of 83, and then the U.S. Embassy in October of 83. So, you know, we've learned nothing from the past that attempts to hit Hezbollah and quote with military attacks to weaken them are completely ineffective have never worked israel tried it again in 2006 invaded southern lebanon thinking that they would just walk over hezbollah and found out that hezbollah had been training and equipping itself preparing tactics in the ensuing uh you know ensuing years to uh, fight the israelis on a on a you know even basis and they basically yes. defeated israel so, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that, that the Israelis haven't learned a thing from this. And I, I guess I'm sort of shocked that uh, Austin and the Biden administration are saying something that's actually sensible. They're trying, they're trying to warn Israel not to do it. And uh, I, I was curious to listen to what Nasrallah had to say in his sermon on Saturday to see if he was going to issue some sort of call to arms, make it an overt, let's rise up and start intensifying our attacks. He didn't do that. But since that sermon, we have seen an increase in attacks by Hezbollah. And I think Hezbollah is actually trying to, they're both trying to damage Israel's capabilities on the northern border, but also bait it. Yeah, come on, attack us. It broaden this war so that we can show that you're not just at war with Palestinians, you're at war with all Arabs, all Muslims. 
And uh, because there already is street sentiment throughout the Arab and Muslim world that something more forceful needs to be done. The leadership of many of these countries have been hesitant. Uh, I noticed that out of the uh, Arab Islamic summit that took place, the emergency summit uh, on, on Saturday, I believe it was, uh, they yes. did not in, decide to impose a variety of sanctions that could have really been de debilitating for Israel. And that was because Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt didn't go along with it yet. But I want to emphasize it's yet. Because yes. if the situa humanitarian situation worsens, then I think the, the political pressures in these countries are going to become so great that they can't hold back and do nothing. Yes, I think uh, the Saudis and the, especially the Saudis, they're playing chess now with the Americans and they're giving time for the Americans also to pressure on the Israelis. They don't want to play all the cards from the beginning, right. like adding all the pressure on Israel. Or I'm not defending the Israeli position, sorry, the uh, Saudi position, but I think from their perspective, they cannot play all their cards uh, now, despite the heavy uh, humanitarian, uh, let's say, price that is being paid uh, by the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Also, there is lots of considerations they have to make with the Iranians in the aftermath of this war, what is going to be the situation of uh, status of Hamas, because Hamas is also supported now by Iran. Iran is not hiding that. So there are so many things that they ha have to be taken into consideration, including the role of Hezbollah. You mentioned yeah. Hezbollah. I think what happened in the past 24 hours on the borders between Israel and Lebanon was uh, extraordinary. It was unprecedented since 2006 war, despite the uh, American side, uh, sorry, the... Uh, all of a sudden, my uh, YouTube uh, uh, live streaming started working on my mobile. I'm like, I'm <laughs> hearing myself what's happening here. <laughs> That's happened to me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I can hear myself from somewhere all of a sudden. Anyways, um, uh, Nasrallah, you, 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 if I followed Nasrallah for a very long time, and he always uh, does what he says, but it seems there is a difference now of a, a media strategy. He didn't say we're going to escalate now. He didn't mention that, like, uh, uh, literally... But what happened in the aftermath of the speech and the quality and the quantity of right. the weapons that are that Hezbollah are using now, uh, it seems that Israel is now uh, sending reinforcement to the north, and this will also relieve some of the pressure on Hamas in right. in the in 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 the Gaza Strip. I think this is the strategy of Hezbollah. They don't want a regional war. This is just my opinion, but they want to relieve the uh, pressure on Hamas, and also there is this. Uh, in the Islamic world, there are different values. And uh, from the Hezbollah point of view, I believe they argue that they, we don't want to intervene uh, further or directly in this war and then pretend that this is our victory. Uh, they want to give Hamas its time because they believe from the military perspective, from the uh, Hamas is not going to be defeated up until this moment. They don't see that there is a potential that uh, Israel is able to defeat uh, and crush Hamas. So why would we intervene in this? But if they see that Hamas is losing the war and uh, Israel not only occupied parts of the Gaza Strip, but they fixed their forces there, then I think there will be different talk uh, from the Hezbollah side. And people really underestimate Hezbollah because they haven't followed the past right. one decade, what Hezbollah did in Syria, the combat uh, experience that they have gained, the the quality uh, weapons that they acquire. Uh, they're not Hamas. They're over 100,000 forces. They have uh, precision missiles and, like, uh, let's say, technology, air defense systems, uh, anti-ship cruise missiles. They have everything that Syria has. Basically, whatever Syria acquires, it goes to uh, to Hezbollah after a few years. So I think it will change the equations if uh, Hezbollah intervenes. Let's see how will Israel react in this regard. But uh, Larry, if I want to move a little bit to the east now, to, U to Ukraine. What okay. is the uh, military state of affairs in Ukraine? Is it safe to say that the U.S. wants to freeze the conflict in Ukraine to focus on the Middle East at the moment? The U.S. has no control over what's happening in Ukraine. It has lost control. Uh, it doesn't have the industrial base to provide Ukraine with the artillery rounds, the aircraft, the uh, actual artillery pieces, tanks, 
everything that would need to be able to sustain a fight against Russia. But more importantly, the United States can't magically produce Ukrainian babies and mm -hmm. manpower that can fill the ranks. Uh, the Ukrainian army has been decimated. Uh, it, uh, it has uh, well over a million casualties, killed in action and wounded combined, well over a million. And what started off as a $40 million, po 40 million population uh, more than two years ago is now down to around 27 million because of people fleeing uh, from the area. So um, on the ground militarily, uh, Ukraine has no initiative. They have no counteroffensive capability. Russia has quashed it, and Russia is in the process of moving on several fronts, albeit slowly, but their, their purpose is not to see how quickly they can capture territory. Their, their entire purpose is about degrading and destroying the Ukrainian military. And the, the, the coincidence of the war out, the outbreak of war in Gaza with Israel has completely diverted uh, U.S. support from Ukraine, sent it to Israel. Uh, military intelligence support, actual military supplies, aircraft, personnel, it's all focused on Israel and supporting Israel. Uh, Ukraine is now uh, the, the redheaded stepchild. It uh, mm. gets the hand-me-down clothes and may get to eat after the, the other children eat. Uh, so it, it's, it's no longer uh, at front and center. And then to add to this, it looks like there's been a conflict that's broken out between the Brits and the Americans over who should continue to be in charge, at least the figurehead uh, for Ukraine. The Brits, it looks like, are backing General Zaluzny. The yes. American CIA is backing Zelensky, the president. And uh, there's uh, you know reports out on Telegram today that there's going to be a complete purge of the Ukrainian military by Zelensky and his crew. Well, if that happens, I cannot imagine the Ukrainian military professional sitting back and letting that happen without dramatic pushback. So what we're seeing really is the complete unraveling of the command structure in Ukraine. And you can't have that unraveling and then hope to remain effective on the battlefront. Yeah. Guys, this is the website of uh, Larry, uh, sonar21.com. Uh, uh, this is the uh, cover of the website. Also, I put the website in the description below, his Telegram and the Substack as well. Please follow him so that you can read his articles and his website. What is he posting uh, there, in my opinion, is important to take a different perspective of what's happening around the world. If I want to end up this conversation with you, uh, Larry, with a question, you can uh, answer it in two, three uh, minutes in this trouble times will china seize the opportunity and take one step forward to what beijing calls a peaceful reunific reunification with uh, taiwan which seems everybody is focused on the middle east and on, on, on ukraine and uh, china it seems now is its uh, hands are more free than before well yeah i think that it, again this is an, uh, an extension of the special military operation by russia the alliance uh, the the both political military alliance that has been formed it's not necessarily enshrined in official documents per se, but it's de facto between Russia and China. And China has been very cautious over the last two months. It, it didn't, it, you know, it's not acting precipitously. It's not moving immediately on Taiwan. And I think it's, I think its plan is to in, enfold Taiwan in through a peaceful process, not through a military conflict. I think a lot of the claims in the West that China intends to conquer Taiwan militarily is more to create a pretext, a justification for expanding a U.S. defense budget that's already out of control. To just, mm -hmm. a, you know, we need these wars overseas. We need these threats overseas in order to spend another, you know, right now it's up to $850 billion. It's headed towards $900 billion. They just, they just produced a bomber that is going to cost $750 million dollars, almost a billion dollars for one plane. This, I mean, what what you're looking at here, it's like, imagine the most wealthy person in the world with some degenerate children. And all the degenerate children are looking to figure out where they can spend money. That's the yes. West. The, the West is, has had too much money, too much wealth, and now it's, it's sinking into a, a swamp of degeneracy. 
And part of that degeneracy is when you think it's a good idea to spend a billion dollars on an aircraft that can either crash on takeoff or landing or get shot down. It's not a magical plane that can resist air defense systems, particularly those in Russia. So um, what, what, it's just we're in a really uh, a transformative time where the old world that existed with the United States basically in charge has come to an end. It's dying. Uh, there will be signs of life here and there, but ultimately it's dead. Something new is forming. And within that, China is trying to take a lead. They they had an agreement with the United States going back 51 years that the United States conceded that Taiwan was part of China, hence the one China policy. Yes. The United States has tried to renege on that. China is not going to back off. Uh, and it's on the website of the State Department up until yeah. this moment. It's there yeah. that they accept uh, Taiwan to be part of China. Yeah. So it's just this is th this is a bit of a distraction to really to keep the military industrial complex fed in the United States. And I think it's it's going to be the death of us. It's going to the very thing that we're claiming that we're building up and funding to save us is going to actually destroy us, in my view. Unfortunately, I think uh, the military industrial complex that we mentioned, these tiny elites, they have waged this war for uh, at some point for their financial gains instead of pursuing the uh, strategic interests of the country. And this has harmed the American economy into great extent and didn't benefit the people in, in right. the United States. And now right. we have to see that the United States has to take a one step back, recalculate its priorities and come back. And it has the potential to do that, but it refuses up until this moment to back uh, one step back and give the opportunity to other countries. That's why I see the situation is very dangerous uh, because the there is some arrogance from the people who do not want to give up their hegemonic <laughs> status. Hegemonic status, yeah, right? You think? You think? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just being, just being diplomatic. Just being diplomatic. <laughs> that's when I say yeah. that. That's one that. That's a truth that even Helen, Helen Keller, who was blind, could see. Yeah. Yeah. Larry, I'm very happy to have you on my show. I would love to have you again in the future, guys. Please give him a follow on uh, all the uh, the website and the Telegram and the Substack in the description below. It's great uh, to uh, support the work of uh, people like Larry. I don't think that these all these smear campaigns against him are uh, legit. I was talking with him now. He seems a great guy. Thank you so much, Larry, for being my guest again. Good work. Thank you. It was a pleasure, and I'll be happy to do it again with you. Thank you so much. And guys, thank you very much for tuning in and watching this video till the end. If you want to support my independent work, you can see on the screen www.patreon.com slash Analysis. And I will see you soon. Ciao. I don't need to tell you the depravity of war. You are all too familiar with its images with the refugees of war, with information that we have revealed showing the everyday squalor and barbarity of war. Information such as the individual deaths of over 130,000 people in Iraq. Individual deaths that were kept secret by the US military who denied that they ever counted the deaths of civilians. Instead, I want to tell you what I think is the way that wars come to be and that wars can be undone. In democracies or the pseudo-democracies that we are evolving into, wars are a result of lies. The Vietnam War and the push for US involvement was a result of the Gulf of Tonkin incident. A lie. The Iraq War famously is a result of lies. Wars in Somalia are a result of lies. The Second World War and the German invasion of Poland was a result of carefully constructed lies. That is war by media. 
Let us ask ourselves of the complicit media, which is the majority of the mainstream press, what is the average death count attributed to each journalist? When we understand that wars come about as a result of lies peddled to the British public and the American public and the publics all over Europe and other countries, then who are the war criminals? It is not just leaders, it is not just soldiers, it is journalists. Journalists are war criminals. And why one might think that that should lead us to a state of despair, that the reality that is constructed around us is constructed by liars, is constructed by people who are close to those that they are meant to be policing. It should lead us also to an optimistic understanding because if wars can be started by lies, peace can be started, peace can be started by truth. So that is our task and it is your task. Go and get the truth. Get into the ballpark and get the ball and give it to us and we'll spread it all over the world.